fantastic. Thank you. And thank you to Stephen Rich for the music. They'll be playing again um, after our presentation. Welcome to the summer series of the sixth annual Tony Warriak Festival. It's sponsored by the Washburn Area Historical Society and the Washburn Heritage Association. The series is made possible by a grant from the Apostle Islands Historic Preservation Conservancy. They've actually been, uh, they funded us from the very beginning. Uh, we're very appreciative of their help. So if you see somebody from that group, tell them thank you. Um, the music, or I already told you the music is provided by Steve Kaufman and Rich Cole and is sponsored by the Washburn Heritage Association tonight. We hope you will stay afterwards for music and refreshments in time. The technical assistance tonight is provided by Lynn Adams and Andrew Grimm. And thank you to the Harbor View for hosting this event. We hope you will join us next week on August 1st for Dora's thanks presentation on our treasured walking trail. So tonight we're fortunate to have with us Monroe Sprague, who is the great grandson of one of Washburn's founding fathers. One local resident said to me recently that the Sprague family has more influence on Washburn's development in a quiet sort of way than some of the more flamboyant developers. And while many families have come and gone, Monroe and Carol Sprague and their family still come here several times a year and actively support this community. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Monroe. Please help me welcome him. Thank you.
everything was really happening. Six years before, in 1884, the town of Washburn had been officially established. We learned all about that from Pete uh, Mann last year. Uh, things were moving fast and furious. The town must have felt really proud uh, about its potential. Two years after MA arrived, uh, he, and after politicking in a uh, close county election, uh, Washburn won the county seat. And a lot of you remember, uh, Bayfield didn't want to give up the books, so the gentleman of this town stole the county books in that famous midnight raid that you know, so many of us heard about. And Pop told about it too. My, uh, my grandfather, he kind of loved the story, he was proud of it. Um, after a few years, and they had his wife Hattie come to town, uh, he must have felt that, uh, that it was an established enough town for his family. He spent eight years down there in Barron County in uh, the and they spent it in Minneapolis. He also uh, brought up his four-year-old daughter, Mary Alice. Um, he left their 14-year-old son, Monroe, uh, in Minneapolis for school where they had family. Uh, in 1895, uh, five years after he got here, and they started the second bank in town, uh, the Northern State Bank. He built a brownstone building on the corner of Washington Avenue and Bayfield Street, right in the middle of town, across from the city library then, but now it's across from City Hall. And the building has been torn down and the stones reincorporated in the back of our uh, City Hall. Uh, the corner has been rounded off and now we have the gas, old gas station in the garden there. Uh, business was booming. There were lumber mills at the south end. There were quarries at the north end. Ships were coming and going. Washington's new port for coal and grain was developing fast. The railroad had been here for 10 years. And Washburn was going to be the railhead for the rest. Oh, things look good. Uh, telephone service had been installed in 1893 and was extended to connect Washburn surrounding communities and the world uh, in 1898. So electric power companies were started to electrify the community, turning the new century of 1900 must have been really exciting for business and everybody here. So in 1900, that was the year M.A. was able to get his 24-year-old son uh, to come and join him in business. That was my grandfather, Monroe A. Sprague. He had just finished the University of Minnesota Law School when he arrived, he was put in charge of the South Shore Lumber Mill. Uh, he was cutting lumber night and day, and Mr. Larson, as you know, had written a lot about the lumber companies back then and all the cutting they did, but how they were so busy. Uh, the South Shore Mill was powered, powered at saws by other equipment with a steam engine, and they needed a steady source. They needed a steady source of water, uh, a pure, clean water for the boilers. The lake water had been used for many years, but the water quality of the South Shore Bay, now the West End Park, was deteriorating because the logs and all the debris in the, mill, in the water from the mills. Uh, having to deal with the water pollution uh, in its early form, the row uh, as manager of the mill decided to drill a well. Um, with the well driller, Mr. Huff, who walked up behind the uh, slope behind the mill and found a big full thistle uh, bush. They figured it had a tap root that went down looking for water. He cut off the full thistle with his knife and told the driller to follow the tap root down. Uh, drilling started in the fall of 1902 and first went pretty quickly, but then they started to hit hard rock. Uh, the drilling slowed to less than a foot a day and it was stopped for the winter and then began in March. 1903. But the drilling, not much better. The rock was still there and it was still hard. But Mr. Huff became very discouraged and wanted to give up. So he and Monroe made a deal and said that he, when he would get to, he would drill to 120 feet and at that point they'd call it quits. So he drilled and it's 119 feet, 8 inches, 4 inches short. He came running right into, into the into the uh, lumber office and said he dropped his whole rig into the well. The whole thing fell into a big cavern below and the water came gushing out. And that's what we have today. 
And ever since that, for the last 115 years, the water has poured from that hole. The flow was measured at 100, uh, 224 gallons a minute to a four inch pipe casing, and it raised the column of water 12 feet. So it had some pressure. And you can read about it all, and you probably have on the black that's there, and on the rock that my dad put there, probably in the 60s. Uh, it was the first reported artesian well in the area and the discovery of artesian water. And uh, in California, we're really understanding the treasure that this water is, for sure. So about that same time, uh, 1902 3 MA, the big businessman bought a farm just north of town. Uh, it was along Highway 13 and uh, between here and Bayfield. Sure, it had been clear cut like the rest of the country and was part of the cutover. It is reported to be about 1,500 acres and stretched between the road and the lakeshore, including that, what we now know as Hoseman Point. It had a few barns and a caretaker's house, and he ran cattle and dairy on it with some crops and orchards. I imagine that uh, he ran it as a gentleman farmer, and I must have thought of maybe a good real estate investment. But you know, the booming economy and the expanding the city. And so we've known the spot over the years we do as where the Club Lido and the Good Time Restaurant. So that's where they're located. Um, in about 1903, MA bought a small bit of land along the lakeshore <coughs> next to the pump house. It wasn't much except brush and weeds that had been clear cut like everything else, I'm sure. But it had a nice little beach and it gave them access to some cool water and a cool and a cooler place in the summer. Um, at first they would just put up tents and uh, from year to year they added a few comforts. However, in 1903, they uh, added enough, made it enough, a suitable enough place for them to stay in the summertime and in the fall. Because in 1905, Monroe, Used it for his honeymoon cabin, uh, cottage. He, he brought his new wife Daisy to town, and they stayed there in the fall of 1905. Uh, this summer cottage is now our family is the one that our family returns to every year. We've done much work on it over the years. We modeled it, you know, many times. Uh, we have kept a lot of our favorite parts <coughs> and uh, the historical character of it. We've used the wood from timeless timber. Uh, in Ashland to finish the parts on the inside. As many of you know, Timeless Timber was the company that milled us out the really logs, they salvaged the lumber and the logs from the lake ship from the bottom of the lake and then cut it into lumber. It's fun to think that some of that lumber that we put in the new place was uh, cut by M.A. and Monroe. <laughs> so they had been his childhood sweetheart and they'd gone to school together in Minneapolis. Uh, they both had attended the University of Minnesota. She had studied to be a school teacher and after graduation had gone west to Colorado to teach. From all her courts, she was one of those strong-minded pioneer women that joined the men to settle the developing country in those years. And I believe she had her own ideas how a civilized society should be lived when she came to Washington. Before the winter of 1905, the two had moved into an apartment in the bank building uh, downtown. In 1905 also, uh, DuPont uh, brought the pop, bought the property uh, up there in the ravine by Barksdale, which you know of. Everybody's heard the story of the stranger in the red booth that came to town and started asking questions and buying property. And uh, if you haven't, you should look it up. I'm not going to tell you to repeat that one tonight. <coughs> but it turned out he was for the Atlantic um, Atlantic uh, Chemical Company, which then was bought by DuPont. Uh, so they started uh, buying property, and soon uh, DuPont Life became incorporated in Washburn. As the managers and workers moved into town, and the company began contributing to the uh, community for the construction of homes, of course, and the DuPont Club later on. But earlier, it uh, contributed and donated the Memorial Park, as a lot of the things stopped and read at the monument. Um, and uh, 
this became a happening place in the summertime. Uh, they built a pavilion where they had parties and beaches, and they had a beach and a long pier for swimming. And there were party boats leaving the picnic for picnics up and down the shore, including down to Houghton. Uh, one of my grandfather's favorite stories was that one summer um, a bear cub was found uh, by one of the citizens, and it was learned that the mother had died of some unfortunate consequence. Uh, so the town uh, took pity on the poor cub and uh, took it under its care. Um, it did so by chaining it to a post down at the Park. Um, and there it became the delight of the summer's entertainment. And you can imagine how the kids used to run back and forth to home every day and report on the bear's activities and what it was doing and what, what it wasn't. And uh, you can imagine how it was fed, you know. And I can also imagine some of the poking and prodding that must have endured. Uh, it's, I have to chuckle with this real contrast to today's bear sensitivities. <laughs> Um, last half of the decade, Washburn was becoming more and more uh, city five with an arrival of DuPont and my grandmother. Uh, I'm sure Washburn had been a lumberjack in a mill worker's town, and I suspect it was pretty rough. Uh, the city was passing ordinances um, left and right, and temperance was growing uh, as a new movement. Uh, one establishment was fined $35 and made to buy a license that it couldn't use because it was uh, found that it's, quote, cream of hops, end of quote, had too much alcohol in it. So the hammer was coming down. Uh, one of my grandfather's favorite stories uh, was that the city leaders passed an ordinance that there uh, could not be a bar uh, within one block of a church. Um, and there were at least seven churches in town. Uh, <laughs> by then, and there must have been a great deal of objection and debate about that. Um, I don't think it's come up in a town hall meeting since, really. Uh, and it may even torn families apart, you know, in the debate. But in the end, my grandfather reported that uh, five churches had to be moved. <laughs> so after year or two, Monroe and Jason moved into, the, into a house on the corner of Washington Avenue and 4th Street. Another favorite story was my dad, of my dad's this time was about the day my grandfather brought home a small pig and walked in the front door. He announced that they were going to raise it up for ham, and Daza calmly listened to his idea and took the pig. She then replied that she would have nothing of it, and proceeded back to the house in the kitchen, she picked up a large knife on the way through, and on the back porch, she neatly slit the pig's throat and threw it on the back lawn. He said there was no more discussion after that. <laughs> and he always liked to say that actions speak a lot louder than words. <laughs> so in 1910 or 11, Monroe bought a car, a motor car, and supposedly the first new one in Washburn. It was a brush roadster. He was 34 years old, successful, and had a new family. He could tour around town with his gorgeous wife in a sporty royal blue open-air car. But I don't have any stories about that. I can only suspect that Daisy had other ideas what she was going to do with her time. He also said that people clearly declined that they were ever going to ride the contraption like that. Uh, so, the one interesting thing about it is, on the back you wrote the detail of the car. And I think we've come a long way since. I always enjoy noticing that windshields were extra. The, ax the axles hadn't developed much beyond the wagon being hickory. And it had 30 inch wheels with ball bearing hubs. So, special. The engine had a one six inch cylinder with a seven inch stroke. It had a 25 pound counterweight to cut down the vibration. So with my, cal with my calculation, that makes it a 232 cubic inch engine, 
for uh, 3 point seats. And it must have been gravity fed because the story was to go up some of the hills, you had to turn around and go up backwards. <laughs> <laughs> the maximum speed was 30 miles an hour, but usually if you made 24 to 25 on a good road, that was great. Um, he drove it here from Minneapolis, 226 miles. It took him 21 hours. <laughs> I figured that was about three days, I, or four, because I don't think he drove after dark. At the bottom there, you might be able to see that it cost $400, and even car agencies then were ready to give deals, because at the bottom you say he really paid uh, 300 with the extras, like the windshield. So I'm sure he felt proud about that, too. So by 1912, M.A. was ready to slow down at age 69 and maybe retire. He started building his retirement home, the farmhouse, and uh, out on the property north of town. This is the rest of the build, restaurant building we know today. The contractor was, M was Mr. Carson, and he built the house with walls using two by eight studs from the mill. The walls were filled to the eaves with sawdust from the mill for insulation. They had a widow's walk on top, as you can see, and they said you could see all the way to Houghton Point from up there. <coughs> like, uh, his wife, Hattie, uh, Susan showed me this tonight, was a painter, and so she painted from up there on the widow's walk. So, this is, I don't think she saw the waterfall, and I'm not sure where the mountain was. <laughs> she had good light to, to paint it. Uh, in the basement, in the basement it had a furnace for central heating, it had a pump for running water, and it had an electric generator for lights. It also had a sewage system for indoor toilets. So in 1913, he and Hattie moved into the house, but he continued to uh, going to town and was on the bank. Uh, I think he was still president of the bank and he had other businesses in town that he kept track of. So life was good in 1915. Uh, the early summer routine was to go down to the lake shore where it was cool. In fact, move the whole house down there. Uh, and um, everyone had, had kids. The kids uh, had a beach and water to play with. Uh, Monroe and Daisy's kids were about eight, six, and two, and they were busy, I'm sure, like all the kids are today. Hard, gotta keep them active with something. They played on the beach. Uh, they named it Sandy Cove, and the lake shore looked a lot different then, as I said. Uh, the land was barren of big, uh, big trees and mostly brush. Erosion had not carved it yet to the point we know today. Um, Another picture of the island that's out off the, off the beach and the point that's, uh, I think, more toward the pier or Washburn. So you can see there was a lot more to it then. Uh, today the overhanging cliff is falling down near the beach area, as many of you may know, and the water isn't too high. We still have a beach if it isn't too high. The island's size and shape has changed a lot. Uh, Monroe, still in his late 30s, uh, and a bit daring, rigged a steel cable in these years from the point over to the island. He put a trolley on it that you could hang from. So basically it was a zip line. Uh, and he hung it with enough slack in that line so that you couldn't really avoid hitting the water when you ran the zip line. So you dipped into it. So once you picked your feet up, feet up off the ground, you were pretty much wet. <laughs> um, back in town, Daisy was keeping up with the local circles. Uh, she was mixing with the wives of other businessmen in town, Mrs. McLeod, the mayor's wife, Mrs. Axley, the doctor's wife, Mrs. Maxie, <clears throat> another businessman, and the banker's wife, Mrs. Morris, Mrs. Faring. Some of you may have known that. Some of them may have been your grandmothers. Um, the, um, 
so said she was getting involved in the social life and she was setting up social, you know, some of the social affairs like luncheon parties and things like that. Um, these luncheon parties were a lot of work, so she directed her children, uh, my uncle, my father, and his sisters, into, into helping set, set them up. And there wasn't any escape, I'm sure, from data. So my uncle, Uncle Vance, he was compliant, and, but also known for his adventure, his imagination, and his occasional prank. Uh, one task was to set the table uh, properly with silver settings and china and water glasses. And you remember those kind of things. Uh, everyone had clock napkins and name cards and places to sit. So they knew where Mrs. Maxie was going to sit. Well, I guess Mrs. Maxie was known for being uh, especially proper and well endowed, uh, which she presented robustly. Somehow my uncle had the idea Mrs. Maxie would be his next objective. So for one luncheon party, he prepared a special water glass for her. He drilled a tiny hole in one side, just down from the edge. When they set the table, they were able to set her water glass just right. The little hole had to be pointing down when she picked it up for drink. Then it would send a little dribble of water down on her bosom, which she would indignantly brush away. It happened several times, from what I understand before she came up her thirst. But I can imagine their delight in watching from the kitchen doorway. And I never heard what the consequences were for any of them. <laughs> so in 1916, M.A.'s daughter, Mary Alice, became fond of a gentleman in town, the pharmacist. This was Mr. Benjamin Whiteman. And they were married. As a wedding gift, and they built a bungalow on First Street for them. Naturally, it has many features that are incorporated in his farmhouse. So this is Mr. Whiteman with the snow then. Uh, as we saw last year, the Casimerics have done a wonderful job bringing that house back to life after the last 100 years. It still has push-through drawers in the kitchen cabinet down between the kitchen and the dining room much as I heard the farmhouse had. This let them wash the dishes and silver in the kitchen, put them away in the cabinet. <clears throat> they could then be retrieved on the other side in the dining room for setting the table. The tall baseboards in the, in the Casmeric's house and the moldings of the cabinets were all made of fine maple and birch and the hardwoods available then. And they've still been, they're uh, still in their same condition and uh, unpainted. Uh, they're very well preserved today, so it's a treasure. By 19, by 1916, uh, the mills were reaching further and further for logs. Much of it was contract work with other companies at the South Shore uh, Mill or the MH uh, Lumber Company. They were cutting timber off the Minnesota North Shore and rafting the logs to Washburn. It was shorter distance to, Ma to Michigan's uh, Upper Peninsula and the Porcupine Mountains. So another story I have of Monroe was his trip back from there on his tugboat, the Mary Alice, pulling a large raft of logs. With a maximum speed of two and a half uh, miles per hour, he had a little, little maneuverability uh, when uh, he was overtaken by a storm. You know how those come up. He pulled the tug and raft in behind Gull Island to wait for the storm. So I'm sure you all know where Gull Island is, so let me, let me illustrate that. You recognize the Apostle, of course, and it's hard to pick out Gull Island unless you get a little closer. So there's Stockton and Madeline in Michigan. So where's Gull? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so he pulls his tugboat in behind there for the storm, and waits for it to finish. Well, it takes three days before it blows over. Uh, and he kind of ran low on provisions, so he got kind of pretty hungry. But he managed to get to the island somehow and start harvesting a few seagull eggs. He found that if there was a single egg in the nest, it was fresher. Because he had noticed that seagulls lay several eggs, and they're several days apart. So if there was only one, that meant it was pretty fresh 
If there's two, he wasn't sure which one was fresh. Otherwise, he noticed they tasted a bit fishy. <laughs> so once the storm passed, he chucked home, and they must have been really worried at home with three days in the storm out there. So in 1917, um, M.A. passed away. I mean, he died from an abdominal problem. We really don't have a better diagnosis. He came ill over several months and was advised he would not get better unless he had an operation. A surgeon, Mr. Dr. McClellan, from, came over from St. Paul and performed the operation in a hospital in Ashland. He began a good recovery but passed away a week, week later at home. And with this proclamation in the paper, the businesses closed for half a day of his funeral. Washburn businesses started to hit some slowdowns in, in the 1919 and in the late, uh, early 20s. Shipbuilding industry was started with great hopes. There was a shipyard, the Anchor shipyard, Shipbuilding Company was uh, established uh, west of the Thompson Mill, which is down west of Tom, uh, 10th, uh, 10th Street. Uh, they received one, an order for one boat uh, the Ashton Hudson, but didn't receive any other significant orders. Uh, the next phase of businesses in Washburn just were not moving. Uh, and Washburn life started to slow down to what it is an easy pace of today. So today our family, our family returns to the old cottage uh, to take in the lake shore and enjoy the lake and the times we did then. We enjoyed Washington as a friendly place, a chance to share some quality times. So my dad used to say that change occurs slower now, but every once in a while the point falls into the, into the lake. So there you have it. I'm glad you're all here in Washburn. It's wonderful to come and join you every summer. Carol and I and our family really enjoy it. So thank you very much. Okay, well, if there's no questions, um, before we get back to the music, I want to remind you that the Legacy Consortium is sponsoring a auction this weekend for the lovely benches you've probably seen around town in front of various businesses. That will take place at 4 o'clock at the Cultural Center. If you haven't seen the